so I think that's what work. Right. Um, my name is Elsa Epstein. I am a visiting uh, fourth year med student from Chicago. I have the pleasure of working in one of Dr. Nanos's lab, and I'm going to present a case of a rapidly progressive <laughs> uh, unilateral kyphosis in a five child. So. So the chief complaint is uh, this is progressive swelling of the left eye and variated in for two to three weeks. Uh, this is a previously healthy 10-year-old uh, girl presenting uh, as an emergent referral from uh, an outside eye center to the eye center uh, for progressive swelling around the left eye and blurry vision for two weeks. Uh, the patient had sustained minor trauma uh, to the left uh, side of the face. Uh, she had been hit with a snowball, uh, had some edema, erythema in the weeks that followed and failed to resolve, uh, was seen by an outside physician and at that point he decided to get some scans as the um, presentation was suggestive for um, some kind of mass. Um, so when she was sent here uh, on exam, she denied any pain or any headache um, but did report the onset of blurry vision uh, with the affirmation of symptoms. Past medical history is uh, full-term delivery, uh, C-section, normal growth and development, no other past medical history, uh, family history of uh, cancer in the maternal grandmother as well as the maternal aunt, and glaucoma in a paternal grandfather. No meds and no allergies, uh, no known drug allergies, just seasonal. Uh, on examination, the initial visual acuity uncorrected, uh, right eye is 20-40, pin holing to 20-25, and then in the left eye was 2400, uh, pinholing to 2025, negative for vision, minus one. Uh, the functional exam, there was an APV uh, with uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 love vision. Uh, extraocular movement was restricted on left lateral gaze, okay bottom one to two. Uh, the confrontation of visual fields were roughly full, um, and then there was just a difference of two millimeters um, between the two eyes, which is okay. Um, I'll talk about the exam examination as a quick fill. The slit lamp exam was with the normal limits bilaterally, and then on dilated sunburst exam, there was a slight uh, one plus disc edema on the left eye with a little blurring of the median vision. So this is just a picture of her during exam. You can kind of see, I think I might have that in here. Yeah. Okay. Can you turn this one? There we go. Okay. So you can just see kind of this violaceous appearing uh, subcutaneous mass with a sort of mass effect on, on the globe. And then in the next picture, we can see that it's actually um, also quite prevalent um, along the zygomatic bone and the cheekbone as well. So, uh, As far as imaging, she did come in with some imaging, so let me get a quick look at that. Um, this is a CT orbits uh, without contrast and axial view. You can see kind of where the area is, but there is a large um, homogenous mass, um, relatively iso dense or dense to the um, extraocular muscles um, along the left lateral uh, orbital wall, and then also kind of coursing around the zygomatic bone here. We can see this better on the next scan. This is a, again a CT without contrast to coronal view. You can actually s um, see here that there is actually a kind of a cortical interruption and non-displaced fracture of the zygomatic bone um, and then the tumor or the mass is seen um, at this aspect as well without extension into the maxillary sinus. This is a, a postgenylineum axial T1 rooted MRI um, and you can see this um, homogeneously enhancing contour uh, lesion uh, that is also coursing around extra orbitally here. Um, and again, just another view of the coronal dot. Um, you can see this kind of homogeneously enhancing mass lesion. So at this point, um, differential diagnosis, and this is not in any particular order of um, likelihood, it's just H for your, um, or my ease, I guess, as well. Um, just in terms of uh, neoplasm, we can think both benign and malignant. Um, rhabdomyosarcoma is obviously a, a big uh, consideration here. You know, unilateral thought process, painless. Um, she's of good age uh, for it. 
and then there's that homogenous uh, region that you see on the imaging. Um, dermoid cysts, you know, obviously it would be more of an, usually would be more of an insidious uh, presentation, but she did have the little trauma, um, plagiographic ruptured dermoid cysts. We would probably see uh, more of a heterogeneous pattern on the imaging with that. Um, metastatic neuroblastoma, you know, generally in a younger child, um, but uh, still a consideration here. Um, and then not necessarily for Kitt's lymphoma, as that would be more endemic to Africa, but more of uh, we could also consider lymphoma in our differential here. Uh, as far as vascular, looking at capillary hemangioma, again, probably a younger um, patient also would appear probably differently on the imaging. And then the lymphangioma um, might appear more heterogeneous um, or hemorrhagic in nature um, on imaging. In terms of inflammatory, um, you want to consider sewer tumor as um, there could be a similar presentation, might be more painful, might not. Um, but again, with a biopsy, that might be a better determination of uh, distinguishing that from other uh, higher likelihood issues. Um, and then lastly, just infectious, you know, common things happen commonly. So we want to obviously consider uh, a cellulitis um, might be more of a fever or uh, leukocytosis decided with, uh, associated with this, but still consideration. So we're going to take a quick look at the histo test that was uh, obtained from a biopsy. This is a light micrograph h &E stain um, at about four times magnification. So it's just kind of taking a bigger look at the tumor itself. Um, the tumor is <coughs> quite cellular um, with these islands of tumor cells kind of uh, growing between these large fibrovascular septae. Um, again, in this uh, area over here, we can see that the tumor cells have actually started to infiltrate around um, this reactive bone. At a higher mag, um, h &E stain again, uh, this is a better look at the cells of the tumor. We can see these kind of large tumor cells that are um, dark staining this area. They have scant amount of cytoplasm and some of it is um, eosinophilic in nature. Um, and then, like you see right here, we get these occasional very large pleomorphic cells. Um, and then this, the cellular uh, picture is kind of surrounded by this dense uh, irregular connective tissue, which is suggestive of a fibroblastic eruption. Uh, immunohistochemistry, um, we can see a positive screen for myogen and, and as well as desmin. Um, I'll get more into the specifics of that in a bit. Uh, additional immunohistochemistry was negative for both uh, CD45 and CD99, ruling out lymphoma as well as Ewing sarcoma. And then um, this is a positive screen for INI1, which is su uh, suggestive that this is actually a malignant stain. So in uh, taking the imaging, uh, the clinical history, as well as the biopsy and the immu immunohistochemistry, this uh, case is uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Um, rhabdomyosarcomas sarcomas are uh, malignant tumors that are derived from undifferentiated uh, mesenchymal tissue. So they're primitive myoblasts. Um, and uh, they are, uh, you know, the precursors to uh, skeletal muscle and uh, connective tissue. So the uh, interesting thing about these tumors is that they actually, a large percent of them arise in areas that are normally lacking skeletal muscle, um, the bladder, prostate, vagina, bile ducts. So uh, just speaks to the uh, kind of uh, pluripotent nature of the cells that form the tumor. Um, as far as epidemiology, it's uh, the most common pediatric soft tissue malignancy uh, or sarcoma, and it makes up about 5% of all childhood and uh, adolescent malignancies. The annual incidence is about 4.3 cases per million um, children, and then the orbit is the primary site in 10% of the cases. So basically, if there's about 350 new cases a year uh, in the United States, there are about 35 that are orbital. Um, it's usually seen as a tumor of the orbit, but less frequently has been found to involve the cons, the eyelid, uh, or the bladder cells. Uh, and it's regarded as the most common malignant orbital tumor of childhood in the United States. Um, clinical features of specifically uh, orbital rhabdomyosarcoma usually presenting with, uh, in the first decade of life. Um, there is just a slight male to female predilection, no racial predilection. 
Um, and it usually presents like our patient with this rapidly progressive unilateral um, proptosis that can present following a minor trauma. Um, you can also possibly have a palpable um, subcons or lid nodule with uh, lidedema or commosis. So this is just looking at the histo, the morphology of it. The two most common types uh, that are found are the embryonal version um, at the top. And this is the most common and uh, generally the most favorable prognosis. Um, it's generally found more in a superior nasal location of the orbit. And then it's characterized by these kind of mixture of cells. They can be either round or elongated spindle cells um, that have an eosin cytoplasm and then they're contained within this myxoid stroma. Um, occasionally with a higher mag or with a, a trichrome stain, you can identify cross striations that would be suggestive of a skeletal myxoid type um, origin. The lower um, example is the alveolar type, which is actually more malignant and less common than the embryonal. Um, it's usually m more common in the inferior orbit, and then you can see um, these, it's characterized by these uh, small round tumor cells that are loosely adherent um, to a very thin network of these uh, fibrovascular septae. So they kind of resemble what you would see in the alveoli of the lung. So the difference between what we're seeing with the tumor um, in this patient is quite variant from these kind of like thin, delicate interstitial uh, septae that are uh, characteristic of an alveolar. And this is just a close up view of the uh, cross striation. It's kind of blurry, sorry. Uh, the cross striations that you could see potentially at higher mag, and this would usually be more in the embryonal um, variant, but this was not uh, the case in our tumor. Uh, radiologic features, kind of what we already talked about. Uh, usually it's a kind of homogenous uh, mass that's isodense to the extra ocular muscles um, on CT. It does enhance with contrast generally, and then earlier tumors are usually found without bony invasion, but the, the um, tumor that I have here, I think I'm just gonna get up too quick, um, is, does actually have some um, bony invasion here. And then on MRI, uh, with a T1 weighted, it's usually the mass would be either uh, ISO intense or hyper intense to the extraocular muscles. Um, and then uh, there's generally moderate or uh, marked uh, post contrast enhancement. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, just uh, in the initial manner or in the initial phase, uh, any child with progressive proptosis uh, within the first two decades of life should have a just detailed history, uh, clinical exam, and then the imaging studies. Um, if it's suggestive for a rhabdo or uh, a mass, you would want to get a prompt biopsy uh, for a few things. The histopathologic diagnosis, which is generally how these tumors are um, diagnosed, and then uh, in terms of management and prognosis, uh, the histo is key. Um, immunohistochemistry can be obtained. Uh, the, the Desmond is more, uh, it can be positive in various types of muscles, so it's not necessarily specific to um, rhabdomyosarcoma. The more specific markers or sensitive and specific uh, are myogenin um, and myoD1, uh, which have been found to be about 97% uh, sensitive and then 90% and 91% uh, respectively with specificity uh, for detecting uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, then we can use some additional markers just to rule out other types of uh, spinal cell tumors. Um, additionally, um, if there is a questionable histologic uh, picture, like what we're seeing with our patient, you can obtain uh, various cytogenetic, cytogenetic analysis uh, via a fish, um, a fluorescent in, in situ hybridization or um, P, uh, reverse transcriptase uh, PCR for uh, detection of this uh, gene or a gene fusion that uh, has been found to be uh, present in about 80% of the alveolar uh, variants of rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, and this can be very uh, crucial for, in terms of uh, prognosis, as well as uh, different uh, staging schemes. We'll take a look at that real quick. So for staging, there's various uh, components that go into staging, the first of which is a uh, loosely TNM or TMM based um, schemata that takes into account, um, just for example, the stage one, 
um, the site of the primary tumor and then the favorable sites uh, generally regarded as the orbit, um, non-paramyngeal, head and neck, uh, genital urinary tract, not kidney, um, uh, the bladder, the prostate, and the biliary tract. Um, unfavorable sites would be other than those that are listed as favorable. Um, and then taking into account the um, actual uh, invasiveness of the tumor, if it's confined to the aboriginal, the primary site, uh, the size less than five centimeters, larger than that, um, and then if there's any regional lymph node involvement, um, and additionally, any metastasis. So we take that into consideration along with the um, surgical pathological group, um, which is based on the um, initial surgical management. Um, a lot of the tumors that will be relatively, or will be uh, relegated to group three, as uh, most of the forms of management are not necessarily to actually resect or um, ex excise the entire tumor um, in the primary surgery. It's more um, to get the biopsy and then if debulking is possible. So there will be a growth residual disease after most of the biopsies, most of the tumors would be in group three. And then that's taken into consideration with the actual um, histology of the tumor. Uh, and then these patients are stratified into various risk groups and then managed in that regard. Uh, in terms of management, until the late 1960s, actually, exenteration was uh, the treatment of choice, but there was an extremely high mortality rate that remained with this treatment. So after the 1970s, uh, there was a movement towards uh, a different type of management for these patients, uh, which involves surgical biopsy um, and excision if possible, chemotherapy as well as radiation. Uh, the chemotherapy regimens are mostly uh, comprised now of the vincristine, actinomycin B, and cyclophosphamide, although the last agent uh, can vary in certain uh, forms of management. Um, and then in terms of if there's like a lower risk, sometimes cyclophosphamide isn't always brought on board. Um, and then exenteration is generally reserved for uh, recurrent or locally persistent disease at this point. In terms of prognosis, um, the IRS uh, is the intergroup uh, rhabdomyosarcoma study. It was a conglomerate of various uh, research groups that were investigating uh, rhabdomyosarcoma separately and kind of came together to take a look at uh, all of the rhabdomyosarcomas in the United States together. They've uh, done various studies. Uh, the, I believe there's a fifth one that was more recently completed, but the fourth study uh, showed actually a three-year failure-free survival rate of um, 91%, 94%, and 80% for groups one, two, and three, uh, respectively. And then in terms of what I was talking about with the histological morphology, that actually plays into the prognosis for patients as um, the five-year survival rate varies between 94% uh, for the embryonal type versus 74 for the alveolar. Um, and then complications of the disease are generally uh, related to uh, the management in terms of side effects of radiation as well as the chemotherapeutic drugs. And those are just briefly discussed there. So back to our patient real briefly. Um, as I discussed before, the patient had been taken to the OR. The tumor was biopsied and debulked at that time. Um, there, it was about, a, I believe they said 2.4 centimeter um, mass. Um, Obviously, from what we looked at with the histo, it's unclear morphology at this point um, with evidence of bony invasion. Um, the immunohistochemistry uh, suggestive of a, a myogenic um, origin. And then the, pen, the, the uh, cytogenic analysis is still pending at this point. Um, at this point, uh, she has been uh, diagnosed with a preliminarily uh, stage one group three, um, and then the, in terms of the low intermediate risk, that will be determined following um, the, de the determination of the histologic uh, com or composition of the tumor. She's uh, currently undergoing a hemonc workup, um, and the bone marrow and PET CTs are still pending. Uh, when she was seen in the clinic on post-op day five, she was uh, doing well. Uh, visual acuity, uncorrected. Um, left had improved from the 2400 on initial exam to 2050 um, at this point, and the H there was uh, no APD. So the take-home points um, in children or patients with a sudden onset of proptosis, 
um, we want to consider an urgent workup, a biopsy, um, and histopathologic exam to confirm a diagnosis. Uh, two major histological types, embryonic and alveolar. Uh, radiation therapy and chemo are treatment schemes, and it's generally a pretty uh, good survival rate um, if caught early. Um, these are my references, and just wanted to say a quick thanks to uh, the phenomenal Intermountain Ocular Research Team and fearless leaders, Dr. Warner and Dr. Namalis, for being so uh, tremendous and welcoming me, and uh, also to Drs. Um, Abbasina and Patel for helping me out with the case and uh, letting me present this evening. Thank you. Thank you.